Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jensen, and this is Media and Crime Control Part 3 for Module 3. Um, this module focuses exclusively on surveillance. So, we live in a society of enhanced surveillance by both government and others, but your text talks about historically we used it for targeted stakeouts by law enforcement and sting operations. Now we live in a camera-saturated public world, so surveillance is much more intrusive into our everyday lives um, as was previously. But now I want you to turn to page 192 in your textbook and refer to a box, which is box 8.1, about romantic encounters. And we're actually going to read this together, and you can follow along as I read out loud. Um, to see how serious this can actually get. And I think this could hit close to home because it happened to a university student. So privacy in new media terms depends on how content is obtained, shared, and used. A key distinction for privacy expectations is found in the difference between content and non-content as they have come to be defined for new media. New media content can be thought of as words and speech, the message being sent. Non-content involves the identity, location, and timestamps connected to the message. The difference is analogous to a written letter placed within an envelope, the content, and the address on the outside of the envelope, the non-content. Court rulings have suggested that there is no expectation of privacy with non-content information because that information is needed to direct messages to appropriate locations. The sender does, however, have an expectation of privacy, while the message is in transit and can expect that it will not be intercepted and read to the same degree that one does not expect a sealed letter to be opened en route to its destination. As with a physical letter, though, once the message reaches its intended recipient, the sender has no expectation of privacy unless a legal expectation of confidentiality exists. The person who receives the content can publicize and distribute it as they could a physical letter. In addition, electronic communications posted in chat rooms or other websites where users submit content for others to read are clearly not seen as private. A recent case that brought a number of privacy concerns involved a Rutgers University undergraduate student who was secretly recorded on a webcam having sex. The camera had been purposefully placed and hidden by his roommate to secretly record the romantic encounter. The student's roommate also tweeted other students and encouraged them to watch a second live feed from the webcam. After becoming aware of the webcam and the distribution of the images, the distraught, embarrassed student committed suicide. His roommate was convicted for invasion of privacy, among other crimes, and sentenced to 30 days in jail, 3 years probation, 300 hours of community service, a $10,000 fine, and counseling on cyberbullying and alternate lifestyles. This came from 2013, and it was a significant case that starts to show us why surveillance needs to really be thought out so that we're not violating privacy when reasonable privacy and expectations about that are, um, re are um, something we should have. So we have to think about how normal it is to be watched and surveilled as some kind of positive and routine activity? Um, and how much did media create a construction of normalcy? I mean, we've heard about things like sex tapes and, and these kinds of things before, um, but it's not as though that that is, again, something widely practiced and used by a lot of people. And um, also, this was done without this person's knowledge. So this is kind of how intense cyberbullying and uh, this can be. And, um, so occasionally, I'll, I'll talk to people of, of older generations and, and they say, you know, I, I don't understand how this could drive someone to consider taking their own life. And I said, well, when you were bullied, it was localized and it was uncomfortable and traumatic, but it also was um, not as distributable to other people. So when it gets distributed to the World Wide Web, um, there is no limit to who can see this activity and how permanent that activity can be to many, many people around the globe. And so you have this kind of exponential effect of humiliation that um, was maybe not experienced before. So when we have something we call the surveillance effect, when it comes to crime and criminal activity, generally we see less deviance when people think they're being watched. 
Um, theoretical explanations for this effect include both deterrence theory and learning theories, where we have increased certainty of punishment paired with those cues or stimuli about a location and the behavior happening there. We also have um, SEPTED, or crime prevention through environmental design, and routine activities theories that suggest things like target hardening to make targets less suitable for victimization. We have some more theory-based prospects out there that start to suggest how surveillance can play a role. Um, first, we have crime displacement. And this is where crime actually moves. So geographically, crime moves to areas that are not under surveillance, so it's not a net reduction. So sometimes it's displaced from this area to this area because there's less monitoring. So it doesn't mean that we actually lost crime. It means it just was transported to a physical new location. Um, so maybe locally in that true local environment, it's gone. But overall, the neighborhood is experiencing crime, and there is still crime in, in the city and in the vicinity. Um, it can also um, occur with time, where crime moves to other times when identification may be harder to make from surveillance. So we like to use a veil of darkness to uh, make it harder to see us on camera. So maybe instead of burglarizing during the day when we think people are away from home, we burglarize more at night when people are asleep. So burglary still happens. It just means we're choosing different times of day um, or maybe different uh, uh, seasons, you know, things when it's raining or snowing or when it's really windy, um, when we're covered up, so that way we're harder to detect. Also functionally crime can be displaced where a different crime is committed or a different technique is used to make detection from surveillance a lot harder. So maybe they um, interrupt the transmission, they distort the camera, they turn the camera to another angle, um, and so they employ different techniques and it means that crime is still happening, it just means it's not being captured. So we have to think about the fact that crime displacement manifests, crime is still occurring, it's just adapting to the surveillance. We also have what we call a diffusion of benefit, where people don't know the boundaries of the surveillance, so the benefit extends beyond the actual surveillance area, um, where people think everything is being recorded and I have to be careful everywhere I go, or maybe surveillance is only here, so I'm just gonna do this over here. So it's kind of interesting to see how that plays out as well. We also have what we call closed circuit TV surveillance, and uh, this is depicted in figure 8.1, where we have kind of like a bubble chart, and this is in your textbook as well. So if you turn to page 191, you'll actually see this flow chart that describes um, these informal effects, okay? So first of all, we have official, meaning, um, you know, including a greater risk of detention, um, that we see better proof for solving cases, and we see greater efficiencies. Informally, we see a greater diffusion of benefits because of possible surveillance. It emboldens law-abiding citizens to use areas which increase natural surveillance of those areas, so maybe they feel safer over here than over here. It also provides general deterrence, reminding all of us of the risk of crime and that uh, we could be punished for it. It also reminds people to take precautions and act in safer ways. So um, that's some of what we see um, illustrated in that model. Um, with closed circuit TV surveillance, note that hypotheses can be derived to actually maybe help us with some research to determine how effective it is. So crime will be deterred, but where mo but where are most crimes committed and what about the displacement? So, and maybe it only works on one kind of crime, um, a physical crime versus one that's more electronic um, or more impersonal. More crimes could be solved um, through using surveillance, but why haven't clearance rates increased? So why is that disconnected? And that might mean we need to be interviewing crime scene investigators and police about um, whether or not that material is usable and permissible in court. We should expect more efficiency, so money will be saved, but are we really even spending less on crime control, or are all these gadgets coming with a huge price tag, but not a big return on investment? So more emboldened citizens um, can create areas being used more. Can we actually sit and record and count all that foot traffic or vehicle traffic to document that actually happening? And people taking direct and deliberate ways to go this way rather than this way because this is a more criminal alley and this is um, a more safe alley. 
people will take more precautions against crime, do they? So we'd have to try to um, somehow estimate um, some of those behaviors people are doing and, and try to capture that in some kind of manner through research. So these are some potential uh, things that research needs to do to, ter to determine its effectiveness. Um, we also have cost and benefits that we need to consider when we think about surveillance generally. So the ultimate question for this chapter becomes, how do social costs of media-based technologies balance off against the crime control benefits? So um, we basically gain a little bit of security, but we often forfeit a little bit of privacy. Um, and it also goes the inverse uh, way as well. What we gain in privacy, we tend to lose in security. So we have to think about what risks we're willing to take. So the considerations are utility. Is it just the greater good for greater numbers? Um, and how does that affect people that are more minority groups? Um, what about the social constructions at work here? Does the received wisdom that surveillance is good and necessary positively affect our calculations of how we interact with people and the kinds of moves we make or decisions that we do to keep ourselves safe? And then what role do the media play in that construction? How does concern with terrorism actually factor into the acceptance of crime control surveillance? And again, this goes to that Patriot Act from 2001. Um, if you are determined to be a potential terrorist, I can now wiretap you. I can look into your finances. I can monitor all your communications. Um, and so if everyone is a potential terrorist, um, we have to think about how that plays out as well. How far do justifications for video surveillance actually extend? Um, things like I mentioned, wiretapping, cell phone monitoring, uh, transmitters to track movement, things like homing devices, monitoring financial transactions, losing some of your financial privacy. So we have to really think through some of these things and time will really tell um, how far we're willing to go and the courts will make decisions on the limitations of these laws. So we're going to wrap up with some of the Surrett text. So Surrett's conclusions on the benefits are that he is doubtful that media by themselves actually deter. And he's also mentioned that in previous chapters. The deterrence effects may be offset by displacement and other social costs. Um, and media efforts to reduce victimization are not really shown to influence the prevention behavior. PSAs to increase cooperation may do so but their effect on overall crime is likely to be negligible. So there are some influences out there, but they're not overwhelming and they don't make big dramatic impacts. Um, his conclusion on the costs are you get some increased depersonalization of criminal justice because everything's videoed and kind of static. You also get isolation of the police from the police. And so you start to get into this us versus them mentality um, where we're constantly watching over our back. Um, you get increased citizen suspicion of surveillance and maybe some other things like images as proof and, and uh, we worry about images and, and video being doctored. Um, we also get increased polarization in society where we don't trust each other anymore. We lose some of that community cohesion and uh, suddenly we're all kind of an island and more um, secluded into our own private lives. There is a possible decrease in public support and legitimacy for the criminal justice system if we feel so spied upon that we can't trust our government and our crime fighters to actually protect us and keep us safe. So Surrett's final caveat that he mentions in this analysis is to beware of the way in which decisions about the use of media-based technology for crime control may be influenced by media-created constructions about how positive and necessary they are. So we have to think about um, sometimes companies themselves trying to sell products and therefore play upon fears and, and demonstrate necessity that really might not truly exist. Um, the media are hardly disinterested neutral players. There's always a product to be sold, a market to be reached, and we have to be very aware of those influences and biases that are going to play into this narrative of media being the one true preventer of crime. So. Uh, Hopefully this clarified some things for you and uh, we'll see you next time.